Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I'm your co-host, Chris Seventy, and flying somewhat solo tonight as uh, Gail isn't able to join us. But I do have a special guest on tonight, uh, Bill McCafferty with uh, PMR2. Bill, how are you doing? Doing great, Chris. I appreciate you having me on. Look forward to uh, spending the next hour with everybody. Yeah, good. It's uh, well, Why don't you just take a quick moment to uh, introduce yourself, tell people what you've been doing. I know we've been talking offline briefly about it, but uh, let everyone know a little bit about you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm from Pennsylvania. Uh, I'm a big family guy. I've been married for 20 years. Uh, I have a 16 and 14 year old. Um, over the last uh, 12 years, I've been building uh, a note business. Um, I have two companies. I have uh, People's Debt Relief Solutions, uh, which is my own portfolio. Uh, within my own portfolio, I, uh, I fully concentrate on buying non-performing and re-performing uh, residential institutional second mortgage notes. Um, like I said, both non-performing and re-performing. Uh, that's my own portfolio. Uh, it, you know, it borrows money, um, and it owns a lot of assets. I have another company, um, which you just mentioned, uh, people's mortgage relief Two. Uh, that's my asset management company. I manage assets for different investors that are looking to buy non-performing seconds and they need somebody to work the file for them. I actually, I get hired. It's a service fee, uh, commission based business. I don't own the asset. Uh, the note investor buys a non-performing second. Uh, they hire me to uh, board the file. I'm not a servicer. We also use servicers. Um, I manage the servicer. I manage the attorneys, uh, manage the bars. And, you know, my job is to uh, get a deal done for us, get a workout done, get a discounted payoff done. Um, and when they get sloppy, try to push through the the slop and, and get a resolution for us, you know, that will at least benefit the portfolio somewhat because within the seconds, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, good and bad stuff. So it's a combination of both um, that you're dealing with, with the asset management company. Mm -hmm. So uh, to put it in perspective, the asset management company has worked about a thousand uh, seconds for different investors, about a hundred different investors over the last 10 years. Um, that is where a lot of my education and uh, real deal experience comes from. And I take all that and I put it back into my own portfolio. So I'm a full-time note investor. This is what I do every day for a living. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a combination of uh, the client's portfolio, the asset management company, and my own portfolio that allows me to do this full-time. Now, it's interesting because one thing that we haven't discussed um, in every episode that we've done really has been the seconds. And it's intrigued me because I'm a first guy. And... Uh, I'd be honest that I'm, you know, a, a neophyte when it comes to second. I actually think I have two of them in my portfolio, which we'll talk about later on because I'll need some advice. Uh, but they're a part of a, a pool that I purchased. But, uh, you know, with seconds, uh, I'd like to just from your perspective, what do you see as the biggest differences between uh, being a seconds guy and a first guy? And also to touch upon that too is what geared you towards seconds versus first, just out of curiosity. No, absolutely. Um, what I see, um, what the biggest difference is um, when you're dealing with non-performing seconds, um, about 80% of your exits are through the homeowner, through the borrower. Whereas I believe from what um, I've been told by different investors and what I've experienced uh, working some first myself, that about 80% of the exits are through the property. Um, you know, I'm sure you can vouch on what those actual statistics and numbers are, mm -hmm. um, but it's more about liquidating the property, um, selling the property, uh, maybe doing some contract for deeds that you guys do. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's in the second space, it's all about the borrower. Um, you know, even when we utilize the foreclosure process and we get close to a sale date, or even sometimes when we go through the foreclosure sale, um, rarely do you ever end up with a property. Mm -hmm. And even when there's a lot of equity in a property um, and you get to a foreclosure sale and you get on the other side, for some reason, a lot of the bars do get a misconception that you can't foreclose. Um, when you do that, they're not going to let you tap into that equity real easy. So majority of the time, you're not really liquidating properties in the second space. Mm 
Um, what, what intrigued me with the seconds is uh, back in 2005, 2006, uh, I started going to uh, local investor groups. Um, just wanted something different in life. Um, I was working a nine to five job at a school. Um, saw some of those commercials on TV about buying uh, properties with no money down. So I, you know, I set out looking for something different. So uh, going to a lot of local groups, I was in the right place at the right time. Uh, 2007, uh, I was at a local real estate group, and that is where I met uh, my mentors and the guys that taught me the business, uh, Dave Van Horn and Partners for Payment Relief. And it's what they started doing. They were buying non-performing seconds. So I dove right into that. Um, you know, didn't start with first, went right into seconds. Um, you know, my first purchase of a non-performing second and a re-performing second were in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of saw the results from both of them right away and just started going full tilt at the seconds. Because when I set out to, to find something in real estate, it was to find a computer-based a business that I could do in my house that I could handle and manage um, without actually going to properties. And from like 2006 to like 2010, I got myself involved in all kinds of different property stuff, rehabs, rentals. Um, I bought some property down in Texas on uh, the Galveston, uh, south of Galveston on Crystal Beach. Um, did some subdivision, all kinds of stuff. Um, some stuff worked out, some stuff didn't. Uh, but I definitely got caught up in the height of the market. And when, when a lot of the mess was going on with the property stuff, that's kind of when I was seeing a lot of good results with these seconds that I was buying. And, uh, you know, a good nugget for everybody is, you know, don't reinvent the wheel. Go find successful people that are truly making money and know exactly what they're doing and figure it out and learn from them. And that's what I did. I, I, I set out to find people that knew what they were doing. And uh, I was very blessed and very thankful to be in the right place at the right time. And I just ran with it. And one of the things that, you know, I've always highly respected you for, Bill, is you keep things very simple. Your systems, how you manage, you don't have, you know, 20 different software programs for doing things. You do it on your own and you just focus, stay laser focused. And uh, you want to talk about that a little bit or? No, nah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think with any business um, and especially in real estate to be successful, um, you know, you, you need to have a clear vision. Uh, you need to have a plan and you absolutely need to know your why. Like, why are you doing this? Um, you know, like I said, I'm a family guy. Uh, my family needed me to succeed. Um, you know, when I started this thing, my goal was to get myself out of a nine to five job and then eventually get my wife out of a nine to five job. Um, I left the school back in 2011. I uh, got my wife out of uh, a teaching job in 2015. Um, and, you know, the both of us are smack in the middle of my kids' lives right now. You know, we're, we're, we're getting them ready for school. We're picking them up from school. We're at all their sporting events. We're involved in stuff um, that they're involved in. And that was real important for me as I started maneuvering through this business. Mm -hmm. I needed to be real clear on my vision and I needed to be real clear on my why. Um, but, you know, it, it, it all comes down to processes and systems within a business. Yeah. Um, and you banged it on the head, you know, I'm, I'm not the smartest guy in the world. Um, but, you know, I do know some things and I got really good in this niche. And as I proceeded to maneuver through it, I just wanted to learn everything I could. Um, and you know, one thing that my mentor beat in my head early on was scalability. You know, if somebody threw a bunch of notes at you or threw a bunch of money at you, could you handle it? And you know, at first it didn't make sense to me, but as I maneuvered through the business, it, it, it started really making sense. And that's what I started building. Uh, you know, I wanted to put all these systems and processes into place. So when the time, when the time came, I could build and I could grow. So, you know, even now I kind of know what I can manage. Um, I know where I can scale to. And like you said, I don't, I don't have anybody that works for me. Uh, um, I've gone back and forth about getting an assistant or having somebody do stuff. Um, but I do outsource a lot. You know, I mean, we outsource the servicing. Um, we outsource attorneys. Um, we have document companies that we use. So there is a lot of outsourcing that we can utilize within this company 
within this business um, without actually hiring people. Um, but, you know, I do stay um, at a level that I'm comfortable at. Um, right now, I'm managing about 125 non-performing seconds uh, for about 25 different investors. Uh, the bulk of them are from two different funds in the business. Mm -hmm. That's kind of where, when I first started, I was managing a lot of, uh, you know, a handful of assets for a lot of different investors. So, you know, somebody could have hired me to work two notes, four notes, seven notes. When it comes to non-performing seconds, it's definitely a numbers game. Uh, the more numbers, the better off you'll be. Because probably one out of two will work out normal and the other one's not going to work out normal. Mm -hmm. So as I started growing, you know, my end result was like, I'd rather have, you know, 150 notes from four different investors than to have 150 notes from 40 different investors. Just so, a, it's a different mindset and a different mentality um, of what you're dealing with within the business. So you touched on a point there that I want to go back because, you know, a lot of times I hear people talk about, oh, I want to buy a second because you can buy them sometimes for, ver they're very affordable. But you just also mentioned, you know, seconds is a numbers game because, you know, it's, you know, you got some that may not work out, some that do well, and then some that kind of just go through the normal process. You know, what, what's your recommendation to people who say, hey, I've only got a, a few thousand bucks and I want to go buy one second? Is that something that, you know, basically they, they throw money away or just curious what your opinion is on that? No, nah, yeah, you know, yeah, it's a numbers game, but you absolutely have to start somewhere. I mean, when I first started, I bought. I bought one non-performing second and then I ended up buying three non-performing seconds. Mm -hmm. um, but you got to start somewhere and you got to get the experience. Mm -hmm. You know, like my mentor has always shared with me, it's a learn by doing business. You're not going to learn this business without doing it. You can sit there and analyze it. You can sit there and do all the due diligence in the world. And there's experts everywhere that will tell you that they're experts with due diligence. But one thing that I figured out with the seconds is, there's a lot of things that you can't see before a purchase. You know, sometimes a, a, a bar will have a friend that has money or they just got some insurance money that you have no idea about. So we can sit there and analyze all day long if this bar is going to pay us or not. But some of the things we can't see. Yeah. So, you know, as much as some work out and some don't, even the ones that don't work out great, there's still money to be made and there's still a whole education platform that can be learned from every aspect of this business. Um, and some deals go in and out of bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, when you buy these non-performing seconds, you know, it may take 12, 24, 36 months before you see a resolution. So that's one of the things that I had heard in the past is seconds. It's more, you have to be more patient. And, you know, one, my, one of my attorneys laughed at me when I, you know, somebody mentioned seconds and he, he looked at me and said, you're not a seconds guy um, because I am, you know, I'm a type A, I you know, focus on the property and, you know, it's, you know, and maybe it's not a fit for me where it fits other people and stuff, but you no, know, it's interesting. Um, you mentioned the timing for, you know, it might take a few years and stuff. You mind just sharing with people kind of, you know, a, a, take one that goes through two years. I mean, what is the process? Cause I'm you know, somewhat interested because I know the process on a first and I'm guessing it's similar, but I, you know, just like to hear it from you as well. No, absolutely. And just to, uh, touch base on what you said, you know, it's definitely true. Um, you know, one of the toughest things about this business and I've learned how to deal with it. And, you know, if you're working a lot of assets, there's always something going on. So you're dealing with it. But there's times that you own a non-performing second and you're moving forward with legal and everything's in place and there's nothing you can do to make the deal go faster. And that's where people struggle. They think, well, let me, you know, let me reach out to the bar every day. Let me do this. Let me do that. And there's just sometimes there's nothing you can do. And when I figured that, that out, that is when I began really building my systems and processes and really fine tuning everything. Um, because sometimes a really good non-performing second deal could last two years, but you only spend 25 or 30 hours on that deal the whole time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, an example would be, you know, you could buy a non-performing second, um, you know, in the first 30 days, you're going through the collateral, you're getting everything organized, you're starting your outreach, you're sending letters out, you're calling the homeowner. 
And early on, I would get excited if somebody, you know, responded on the other side. And then eventually I figured out the people that respond to me in the first 60 days are just trying to tell me a story and actually push me away. Like they're not trying to actually resolve the non-performing second within the first 60 days. It's they're trying to give me this crazy story. So I'm scared and I get pushed away. So that is why I learned that, you know, the foreclosure process and the legal process uh, with non-performing seconds is so crucial. Um, everywhere from, you know, if it's a no equity deal to a full equity deal to an upside down deal. Mm -hmm. um, the foreclosure process is not really about getting possession of the property, but it's about creating leverage and giving a homeowner a deadline to actually deal with you. The numbers are probably a little different, but, you know, four or five years ago, I used to say 75% of my exits happen. 30 days before the foreclosure sale or 30 days after the foreclosure sale. Mm -hmm. No matter what I did the whole time leading up to that, the deal wasn't going to get done until we got close to a foreclosure sale. So, you know, you could be in a, you know, let's just say a state like uh, Kentucky or Illinois, you know, you could be 12 months into the foreclosure process with a sale date set and then month or 13 or 14, that homeowner files bankruptcy. Yep. And then it, you know, depending on if it's chapter seven or chapter 13, you know, that could delay the process. Maybe you're included in the chapter 13 plan. You know, if it's a chapter seven, they're going to eventually get discharged and I can go after the property. Um, mm -hmm. Because when a homeowner gets discharged in a chapter seven bankruptcy, uh, they're personally not liable anymore for the debt, but the lien still exists on the property. Mm -hmm. So you'll have plenty of borrowers that will do that. We'll get discharged from the seven BK in four or five months. And then you start back after the house. And I don't know if they just didn't understand it. If an attorney lied to them or they just, you know, were just happy that the bankruptcy stopped everything. But all of a sudden they're realizing that they're going to have to deal with the lender again, if they want to stay in the property. And then all of a sudden the attorney convinces them to now do chapter 13. <laughs> and they file that and things don't work out. And all of a sudden you're out two years now. You went through a lot of the foreclosure process. Then they utilize bankruptcy to try to get you to go away. And things didn't work out. Let's say in that chapter 13 bankruptcy and it gets dismissed. And all of a sudden there you are again. So, you know, it really is a game of patience sometime. And, and that's why it's really with the seconds, it's about the portfolio rather than the deal itself mm -hmm. um, because your decisions are being based off of everything that's going on in the portfolio. So on a deal like this that we're using the example, you know, I'd be killing myself if I was just sitting there and I had one deal going on, but because I have other stuff going on, I can be patient. Mm -hmm. And, you know, now that I've been doing this so long, I know a deal like that is not done yet. It's eventually going to come back to life. Well, it's interesting because two things popped in my head in that, you know, with, it seems, you know, with first, you kind of know the time frame, I think a little better than you do on seconds. So as a full time guy in seconds, it must be more challenging or even more stressful if you're, you know, you're trying to, you know, take your, you know, figure out your cash flow or your future cash flows on things to, you know, again, put food on the table. Um, you know, that can be challenging if, you know, you got a bunch of borrowers filing BKs or whatnot and so forth. And again, I know you've got that other service that you have um, where you're managing this for clients and so forth. Um, you know, is that kind of, you know, for somebody that doesn't have a service like that, is it more challenging um, because it's, you know, the, the, the cash flows are more unstable? Absolutely. Like I never, you know, I listen to people tell me they're buying a non-performing note and this is what their expected ROI is or their yield. And I just chuckle because, you know, there's a lot of money to be made in this space, but you really don't know. Number one, you know, you may want to, you may say, this is what I want out of it. But when push comes to shove, the homeowner may only be able to afford a certain amount and you're going to have to take that to get the deal done. I um, mean, it's not about your yield. It's about what they can afford and what they're comfortable paying you every month. Yeah. And, you know, one out of three of these foreclosures in the non-performing second space get contested by an opposing attorney 
And when that happens, you know, you can't just disappear. Like you, you have to answer. So when I file a complaint or I request judgment, you know, a homeowner can answer with their opposing attorney and they can request a lot of different stuff from us. So, you know, you were just talking about before the webinar, before the, the webinar started um, about some of the processes to get licensed in the different states. Mm -hmm. So today I got an email from an attorney and we got to an answer, um, you know, a, an opposing attorney and a bar responded to our judgment request. Um, and it's basically called uh, discovery. Uh, we have to produce a bunch of different documents that they're requesting. Yeah, interrogatories, and maybe. You got it. Everywhere from, you know, the payment history through PNC, the payment history through uh, land home financial services was servicing it. And then Madison was servicing it. So I got to get all the payment history. I got to get all the RESPA letters. You know, it's like 20 questions that we have to respond to. And all they're doing is trying to get you to go away. You know, we're going to, we're going to be able to produce everything and get everything, but it's just, it's time consuming. And cost money. And exactly. So it, it, it's kind of, it's crazy what goes on because this opposing attorneys on the other side saying, well, let's request all this and I can get them to go away. Yeah. All I'm saying is I'm going to be able to produce everything mm -hmm. and you're going to have to give me more money when push comes to shove because you made me do all this work one day. <laughs> so it's just funny how it works. So I have a question for you so for everyone that's listening too, because here's a real life example um, of a second that, like I said, I've got like, two in my portfolio and you know I this was included as part of a pool that I acquired and you know the borrowers in default on the first and second there's a little bit of equity in the property still uh, the borrower was in the first and filed for foreclosure and it basically got they stalled it I'll say because the borrower was trying to refinance and the borrower ended up passing away um, back in June or July so they basically, you know, opened it back up for the first to now, if they want, go through the, with the foreclosure. And I'm sitting here like, you know, I go online and check and be like, okay, why aren't they filing? Why aren't they filing? You know, I'm in second. I'm used to being at first. And the minute that would happen, I'm like, okay, I'm yep. filing for foreclosure and I'm going to go get this property so I can secure it and sell it. And I'm sitting here in the second position, like twiddling my thumbs and, you know, ask my attorney what to do because we did have to file because we were named in the suit when the first filed, um, you know, because we we're a, a junior lien holder. But now, and he's like, you just wait. And I'm sitting here like, it's killing me. What, you know, is there anything else I can do um, from that perspective? That it's what you said. It's just, it's a major weight game with the seconds. It really does test your patience. It's definitely a true, uh, a true skill that you, uh, that you take on and you have to deal with. Yeah. Um, you know, like with the first, I know, like, like you said, there's a lot of hands on stuff mm -hmm. that you're dealing with and you have to push forward or the deal's not going to move forward. With the seconds, there's a lot of things that you really can't do and you just have to be patient. Um, and that's, you know, what I learned early on with the foreclosure process is that that's really your true, um, your true way to get a deal done and to create that leverage that we're looking for. Okay. Now with seconds as well, you know, and again, all my experience with first, you know, I always worry about taxes and homeowners insurance and stuff like that. Is that stuff as a second sky that you also focus on or is it assumed, okay, the first has it or, you know, how is that typically handled uh, in your world? No, nah, absolutely. So, you know, one big misconception with delinquent seconds are that you're dealing with lower income people and you're dealing with lower income properties. I would you think know, it's the opposite. You're dealing with probably better borrowers than you well, are with the people like I'm buying. I'm buying fifty thousand exactly. properties. You're buying three hundred thousand dollar properties with a thirty thousand mm. dollar or a hundred thousand dollar second. Absolutely. So all day long. So when you're buying in that range, even if the first mortgage is not current, mm -hmm. um, but majority of the deals that we're working, the first is current. Mm -hmm. You know, the first is paying the taxes and the insurance. It's escrowed in there. Yep. And you know. If the homeowner is not paying on the first mortgage and it's, you know, a $300,000 loan from the first mortgage, the mm -hmm. first is going to make sure those taxes are being paid 
and they're going to force insurance on the property to protect themselves. So, you know, that part of the business is what really got me comfortable, um, you know, maneuvering through it, knowing that the first is dealing with that. Um, you know, now with, with insurance, when I'm with a non-performing second, I'm not too worried about, um, you know, getting myself listed as lost pay. But once I get a, a loan re-performing or I buy a re-performing loan, um, you know, I do want to reach out and be listed on the insurance policy as lost pay. Yeah. But now nah, it's, uh, it's one of the best things about the second space is that, you know, the first is dealing with the taxes and the insurance. Like I said, it's usually escrowed. So is it, you know, I'm sitting here with things, you know, my brain's starting to spin. I'm sitting here and thinking <laughs> seconds. I'm sitting thinking, okay, so you're not fronting taxes usually. You're not fronting insurance. You're typically not foreclosing. You really don't have a lot of costs after the acquisition on these things besides your servicing fees. Is, is, am I missing something? Just nah, I mean, legal expense is your big yep. one. I mean, if you're not prepared for it, it'll crush you. Yep. So, you know, if you buy 30 delinquent seconds and you expect to go push legal on all of them, it's a very expensive. Yep. Um, it's very expensive. So you just need to be prepared. You know, you need to understand the difference between your judicial states and your non-judicial states. Mm -hmm. And like we just talked about earlier, you know, when a loan is contested and you're in the middle of the process, you can't just say I'm done and I don't want to spend any more legal fees. You you kind of, you're foreclosing on somebody. So you're suing somebody. You now have to produce what they're asking for and respond. Yeah. And just like in any business, you know, you could get sued at any time and you have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's basically purchase price and legal cost and servicing mm -hmm. costs are your three costs for when you buy a, a non-performing second. Now, do you buy lines of credit as well, or typically just, um, you know, seconds? And if you do buy lines of credit, is there really a difference between them? And nah, I mean, in my world, it's you're either it's, it's a, a fixed rate second or a line of credit second. It okay. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me. It's just a delinquent second. Mm -hmm. you know, because when we resolve it, we're going to we're going to put, you know, a fixed rate around it. Yeah. You know, we're going to create a new document. You know, it happens like it actually just happened last week and it's probably only happened about five times total to me is somebody actually reinstating their loan. Okay. So, and, and once they reinstate it, the old terms are in place. So we don't modify it. Yep. But a lot of times, um, you know, the reinstatement's too much or, you know, they reach out and, you know, we just create a new agreement and it's just cleaner. Um, even this person that reinstated last week on the line, they reinstated on a line of credit. So mm -hmm. the line of credit will term out and it'll be all situated. But I always, even when they reinstate kind of reach out, Hey, do you want to put a new agreement, a new agreement in place? Do you want to redo your terms? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the people that just reinstate just don't want to talk to you. They just want to hide and mm -hmm. they want you to, they want you to go away. So, um, you know, with that, uh, you know, do you typically with your business goal, try and get either the short payoff or do you try and get them the reinstate or is it really each one is, it sounds like each one just treated differently in that sense, but from a percentage standpoint, um, you know, do you see, I'm guessing you see a lot more payoffs on seconds than you do on first. Um, you know, I rarely see payoffs. I get, you know, reinstatements pretty frequently or, you know, do a lot of modifications, uh, you know, when borrowers truly want to do stay in the property. But, you know, one thing that I just want to mention that you joked about early on is if they reach out to you in the first 60 days. And a lot of times that's very similar on the first side as well. I'm laughing because I ran into that situation uh, today, actually. Um, with somebody who for the last 90 days has been promising to come up with about five grand and um, still haven't come up with $500, never mind five grand. And, uh, you know, they're, they're stalling. And that's what I learned early on. Like, if I didn't start legal on a deal like that, now I'm out 90 to 120 days, mm -hmm. still being promised something, but there's no pressure going on them. Yeah. So, you know, that's truly what creates the leverage. Um, but no, nah, it's, it's a combination of both, but yeah, you definitely uh, get a lot of discounted payoffs in the second space. Um, early on when I was doing this, uh, when I started negotiating with a homeowner, it was all about like not talking numbers, 
seeing what they wanted, getting a feel for what they can afford and all that. But as I maneuvered through, I created a lot of processes um, and put them in place to help speed everything up. Mm -hmm. So one thing that I do uh, when a homeowner does reach out, I, uh, I have a six page uh, loss mitigation form and they have to supply that form filled out with a bunch of financial documents. Mm -hmm. And it's more of a stepping stone than me really studying their financials and trying to become their financial advisor. Yeah. Because with a lot of these seconds, it's about what they can afford, but it's pretty easy to put a payment around a 20, 30, $40,000 second. Yeah. Um, when, when all the cards are laid out, mm -hmm. but then it's kind of in their court. And once they supply everything back to me, uh, one thing that I've gotten really good at is I have a, a two page, uh, option sheet that I put in front of them, mm -hmm. uh, three payment options and a discounted payoff option. Mm -hmm. And it's just to kind of, it's kind of just to let them know the dialogue that everything needs to be kind of negotiated around. So it's not written in stone. Like they have to pick one of these options or, you know, the mm -hmm. discounted payoff is, you know, written in stone, but you know, maybe they say, Hey, I like option four, but I can only do a discounted payoff at this amount. Well, mm -hmm. it's going to start the negotiation. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe they like one of your options um, because both I have three payment options and the payment options are um, there's an arrears part, you know, what can they put down up front? and how we're going to deal with the rest of the arrears that they can't pay on. And mm -hmm. then the second part is how we're going to deal with the loan balance. Mm -hmm. So maybe they like one of the arrears plans and they like one of the loan balances. So it's just a, it's just a way to keep the deal moving forward and to speed up because the hardest thing to do in real estate is to close a deal. Yeah. No matter what you do, if you're yeah. rehabbing houses, if you're mm -hmm. wholesaling, if you're working loans out, the hardest deal is to get some, the hardest thing to do is to get somebody to agree and send you money and close the deal. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned because sometimes I know people will listen and they'll try and target like to get four months or five months of reinstatement. And sometimes, you know, you can't get water from a rock, you know, with some of these borrowers and, you know, on the first side of things, it's like, okay, do you really want to boot somebody out of a house that, you know, for, they can't come up with 2000, but they can come up with a thousand bucks, which is going to cost you a thousand bucks by the time you send the demand letter. And I mean, a yep. hundred bucks for a demand letter and then start that foreclosure process. Um, but, you know, it's interesting that the other thing you touched upon a little bit too is, um, you know, just the fact that, um, you know, closing the deal and the aspect of, uh, you know, what you touched upon earlier about the returns and so forth. And, you know, I like to look at, you know, you know, your, your returns is like standing up in the tee and hitting a golf ball. I mean, that's how accurate your returns are going to be. Like, tell me how far, tell me before you hit the ball, how far it's going to go and where it's going to land. That's kind of how, you know, these calculators are. And I'll be the first day I built a very robust calculator and I enjoyed doing it and use it. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's garbage in, garbage out because you can't predict what the borrower is going to be doing. No, and it's, yeah. it's definitely good to have an idea. And, yep. you know, you, you, mm. I always say with the seconds, like when you work, when you eventually work out a, a a deal with a homeowner and they start paying again, mm -hmm. that's when you can determine like, okay, this is a good reperformer that I might be able to sell. Yeah. You know, the return's not going to be too crazy for me to sell it. I'm just going to keep it. Yeah. Um, and then it's about, you know, not to get sidetracked, but then it's about leveraging the portfolio to see the true returns and to really get creative. Yeah. And it's also the thing that I think a lot of people miss upon is, you know, everyone always talks about velocity and money, but if you've got a deal that you, you, you got low dollar value into the deal and it's, you know, given good returns, it's like, do I sell it or not? You also got to look at, okay, what am I going to do with that money? You know, if there's nothing there to invest in it right now, you know, and I know people that do that, they're like, oh, I'll sell this deal. And then their money sits for six months and it doesn't do anything. It's like, you know, you could have still collected, you know, payments over the next six months and stuff. And I see uh, that a lot as well. Nah, it's, it's the, uh, it's the good and bad of the business. So actually right before I got on the call with you, um, I got an email from FCI that, uh, one of our uh, seconds was just paid off. We knew they were refinancing. Yep. So, um, you know, it was like a $23,000 second. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's what you just said. It's one of the best seconds that we have, um, in one of the IRAs. 
-hmm. And it's cool. Like we got the payoff and it's great and all, but now I got to go deploy it again. (laughs) It's a good problem to have. So one of the things that I hear a lot from, you know, people in the first, and it's almost, you know, it's interesting because sometimes you hear people like talk in first and seconds and it's almost like a rivalry, which I honestly, I don't know why, but, um, you know, sometimes you hear people like, you know, who are, you know, do a lot of stuff on first, so like, oh, seconds, you know, and kind of toss them aside and stuff like that. I hear it more from people who do first about seconds and seconds about first. But um, one of the questions I, you know, I was always curious about with seconds is I know during the downturn, there was a large, you know, a large demand for people getting, you know, piggyback mortgages and stuff. Um, and, you know, people are always concerned about supply. How do you see the supply in the second industry? Um, you know, and again, as a, a you know, called, you know, you're a larger main street investor, but you're not, you know, a hundred million dollar fund. So I'm just curious, you know, for people who are out there listening as well, who, you know, might want to get in seconds or involved in seconds, do you still see plentiful supply for, uh, yeah. the, the I mean, investors? That- this is my best year within the asset management company um, and outside since 2015. So, mm-hmm. you know, 2016, 2017, it definitely got slow. Mm-hmm. Um, 2018, there was a big trade. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like anything, you know, how bad do you want it? Go mm-hmm. out and find it. You need to network. It's not easy. You know, you get ton- you, you probably get the same thing. You get the emails, you get the, the Facebook messages. Hey, that was a great webinar. I'm new to the business. Um, how do you get your notes? <laughs> like there's no easy answer. It, it, it's about going to these different conferences. It's about networking and adding value. You know, my asset management company, I've added a lot of value to different people. I've put myself around a hundred to 200 different note buyers that are always looking for product. Um, over the last couple of years, I've put myself around some hedge funds that are looking for product. You know, I call them, I call them the paper chasers. You know, I personally don't have tons of time all the time to be uh, sourcing every day and sourcing is a humongous part of this business. But what I figured out is I can add value to people and I can put myself around people that are sourcing every day and I can take advantage of that when I need product. Yeah. I mean, like, for myself personally, uh, you know, I'm not out there calling hedge funds and banks. I still work a nine to five job and so forth. But what I've got, you know, my niche has been, uh, you know, working with a few of these funds. I solve some of their problems by taking stuff that might be a little hairier than what most people want. I mean, a lot of people just want, you know, hey, I want to buy a first position note that's got, you know, 30% equity in it in a non-judicial state. And I want to get it for 40 cents on the dollar. And it's like, well, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, But, you know, then you got some, you know, these hairier ones where, you know, they've been dragged out or in foreclosure, or there might be some clouded title or some, you know, they, they need work. And a lot of people today, don't want to do work, unfortunately. And, but if you do like to, you know, if you can solve a problem like that with some of these funds that are uh, starting to liquidate or it's a closed end fund that they're closing, um, they're going to say, Hey, look, you know, if, you know, I'll sell you these five, but can you take these five hairy ones off my chest? And you do, then next time it happens, they're going to call and all of a sudden you're going to realize they're like, Hey, I want to dump these 10 assets and you know, you're getting them for, you know, pennies on a dollar and realize, Hey, three of them are actually really good. <laughs> no, that's what it is. It's, it's definitely, you banged it on the head. You know, even with the seconds, it's, you know, everybody wants a, a non-judicial, non-performing second with tons of equity at a great price. Uh, they're real hard to find right now. You can get them, um, but you're going to pay for them. <laughs> nah, absolutely. And it's what I just said. You're exiting through the homeowner. So, you know, you're going to spend that top dollar to get that asset. You know, sometimes, you know, that homeowner can only afford so much. So you're better off sometimes with these no equity deals that you bought for a lower price. That's where some of the great returns come from. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and like I said, it's, it's a balance of everything. I mean, equity is definitely good to have. It protects you if you have to liquidate. It makes your re-performing second more valuable when you go to sell it. Mm-hmm. You know, I only like to leverage my re-performing seconds that have equity. If I sell a partial or mm-hmm. I do some type of collateral assignment, you know, I only like to do them on my re-performing seconds that have equity. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense to reduce risk um, from that perspective. Well, you know, I was just having this conversation. This uh, I went out to lunch actually yesterday uh, with two investors up in New York City. 
Mm -hmm. um, we were just having this conversation. You know, they were talking about a, a, a note seller um, in our in our space um, who has a hedge fund, and they just said they made the comment that, well, if he's selling any type of notes, they it's got to it's got to be a bad note. <laughs> And I'm just like, that's not true. Sometimes these funds actually sell what looks like the better notes because mm -hmm. they can get more money for it. And they, you know, if they're in this business and they're, and they've lasted, they get it, which means you need to sell the good stuff because people need to succeed yeah. to come back and buy from you. Mm -hmm. And another thing to think about is, you know, with my asset management company, you know, I'm working 125 loans, probably about 80 of those loans are an act of foreclosure. Wow. You know, do you know how hard it would be for a fund to buy 125 assets and pump 80 of them down the foreclosure pipeline? <sighs> they would go out of business. Yeah. So when you start thinking about it that way, I was like, you know, the hedge funds business model isn't to buy 150 notes and put them all down the pipeline of foreclosure. You know, they might randomly pick out 30 and play with them. They're going to sit on a bunch and they're going to sell some. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's, yep, absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, because I know one fund I work with, they won't foreclose. They just won't spend the money. They don't want to deal with the timing. They'd rather sell it off. And, you know, similar to like a bank's philosophy of, you know, the banks, you know, they, you know, the foreclosure for them by the time, the money they can't lend and everything else. And, you know, this fund just, I mean, doesn't want to go through it because they're also afraid they're going to get sued and so forth. So they'd rather just turn around and, you know, Hey, oh. look, and, you know, you'll take, you know, take it. And, you know, I'd say 80% of the assets I bought from them probably ended up going, you know, had to foreclose on, um, unfortunately, but, uh, you know, you know it's, it's part of business as well. Here's like a little thing that I tell a lot of different people, um, you know, the biggest thing that people fear in a non-performing second space is a homeowner files chapter 13 on an upside down deal and they file a motion to strip your second mortgage. And what that means is they file chapter 13 bankruptcy. They file a motion to strip your second lien. They're basically telling the court there's no equity above the first mortgage. The value of the house is 200 grand. I owe 200 grand on a first mortgage. I owe 50 on a second. Yeah. I want to strip that. So there will be a hearing where they can prove their value. We can prove our value. Um, and a homeowner has to complete the plan, you know, bankruptcy yeah. plans, three to five mm -hmm. years, and mm -hmm. they actually have to complete the plan before you actually get stripped. Okay. So that is like the biggest thing that people fear in this space. So when people are looking at like no equity deals or they're, mm -hmm. they're looking at stuff in different States. They're like, well, I don't want to get stripped. And then I share with them that, you know, I've actually had three seconds over the last five years that filed the motion to strip my second mortgage. Mm -hmm. It was granted, but then I became the number one unsecured creditor. Yeah. And I got unsecured BK payments on these mm -hmm. three bankruptcy files that I got stripped on. Mm -hmm. And believe me, I made a lot of money as an unsecured creditor. <laughs> and it's just stuff people don't understand or realize happens because they're scared to play the game. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and as I started to maneuver through this thing, you know, I had, I had mentors and I had people that I could talk to, but it was all like just new territory every time we started doing something. And I was always excited, win or lose. I wanted to figure it out and see what the next step was and what could happen. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of good things happen all along the way. So. Well, it's interesting because that was one of my questions was, you know, and then you start talking about because the other component I have is, you know, I love notes that are in bankruptcy. And I've done very well with them. But you know, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, how many actually finished the plan, you know, and you just mentioned that you only stripped if they finished a plan and so forth. And, you know, I've, you know, you know, I typically like to buy them at about 18 to 24 months in, because like you said, they're three to five years. So at 24 months, they kind of see a light at the end of the tunnel with, you know, a lot of the credit card debt and you can, you know, see what that they would get wiped out and so forth. But, um, you know, it, it's interesting because I wasn't thinking of it that way. I was just thinking like, you know, oh, you get stripped from that perspective. And I know the other concern people have is, you know, if you're foreclosed and it's upside down, you know, you get wiped out at the foreclosure auction, uh, you know, from that perspective, but 
on the flip side on first, you know, a lot of times you, you get these BPOs done that say the property's worth, you know, 75,000. And, you know, it's, you know, typically I mark them 20, 30% off that because that's truly what they're worth um, in the grand scheme of things. So it's almost like, you know, similar where you're getting stripped of equity in that sense. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think, you know, probably six years ago, mm -hmm. um, it was probably one out of four would actually complete the bankruptcy plan. Okay. The other three would fall out. Mm -hmm. But over the last five to six years, a lot of us have forced these homeowners into chapter 13 from the second position mm -hmm. and the plans have gotten easier. Okay. So I, I probably say right now, one out of two will complete it. The other one will fall out. And when mm -hmm. they fall out, the lien's vowed again, mm -hmm. not stripped. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, I had three that were unsecured. I became the number one unsecured creditor and, you, mm -hmm. you know, between these three bankruptcy files, you know, I've mm -hmm. probably made over a hundred grand on unsecured payments. Okay. Uh, one quick question I was going to ask too, um, was what do you, what's the pricing like on seconds? I know, for example, first, um, you know, on a performing first year, anywhere from, you know, 70 to 85 cents on the dollar non-performing typically between 30 and you know 65 cents on the dollar um you know curious where seconds typically fall in to play on that absolutely so not to whet everybody's appetite when we first started buying these back in 09 and 2010 you could buy you could buy these for 10 to 20 cents on the loan balance and right now i would say pricing on non-performing seconds are probably anywhere from 10 cents on the loan balance all the way up to about 70 cents on the loan balance. And the biggest factors are the status of the first mortgage. Mm -hmm. You know, clearly if something's delinquent, I can buy it a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm. And if the first is current, it's going to cost me more. Uh, the state that it's in, you know, non-judicial states, you can get more money for. Mm -hmm. um, judicial states um, are going to be cheaper. Um, and note sellers know that because they're cheaper because it's going to take me longer to go down the foreclosure path and it's going to cost me more money. Where a non-judicial, it's a lot quicker and it's going to cost me a lot less in uh, legal expenses. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then the third big one is uh, the equity. You know, is it a completely, if it, you know, it's combined loan to value. You know, you're taking mm -hmm. into consideration what the first is owed, what the value of the house. Is my second covered in equity? Is partial of it covered in equity or is it upside down? Mm -hmm. So those three factors are really going to mm -hmm. um, influence the pricing. And it's, you know, it's all over the place right now. You mm -hmm. know, I, I personally would never, ever buy a non-performing second over 50 cents on the dollar. No mm -hmm. matter what the equity level is, no matter what state or where it's at, um, I'm not going above that. And that is probably why personally I have bought of my, my last 20 purchases, probably about 14 of those have been re-performing seconds and not non-performing seconds. Because mm -hmm. the last couple of years, the prices have been driven up. And when you buy re-performing seconds, it's based off your yield. Yep. And that's it. There's no other factors in my opinion. Now, clearly the seasoning on the loan, the equity position, the state that it's in, and the note seller that it's coming from will influence that yield, but it's based off the yield that you want. Okay. Um, well, one of the things I want to also talk about, and if people have questions, again, feel free to put them in the uh, chat box and so forth. But uh, recently, I, I got an email from you that uh, you're also now um, starting to assist people in learning about seconds. Uh, do you want to talk about uh, what you got going on there? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, it's, it's been a long time in the making. Um, and I've, you know, I've went back and forth for years about putting an education platform out. Uh, but just about a, two months ago, uh, we launched a, 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 an education course. Um, it's geared on, you know, every aspect of the non-performing and re-performing second mortgage space. Um, you know, it goes everywhere from building the back office, building the business, um, through sourcing, through due diligence, um, through boarding files to working them out, um, bankruptcy, attorneys, legal, 
um, all the way through to managing a, uh, a portfolio of mortgage notes. So um, that was just released. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's about 13 hours of, uh, of content in 11 modules. Um, I call it my note business toolkit. It's all my documents, spreadsheets, agreements, mm -hmm. um, everything that I have all, have to offer that I've put together over the last 10 mm -hmm. years. Mm -hmm. And um, also a, a six month uh, private group for support. Okay. So that's what it is right now. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're okay with it, I'd like to maybe put my information out on your page, my contact info. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. When we're done, mm -hmm. that would be the easiest way. And, Mm -hmm. instead of me trying to share it right now. Yep. No, no problem. Um, so it's interesting, uh, you know, cause one of the things you mentioned Ron, is putting all your forms and so forth. Cause one of the things that I, and again, you know, I see in this business um, as part of a challenge is there's a lot of, you know, ways to learn how to buy a note, but there is such a big difference between buying a note and running a note business. And it seems like, you know, some of what you, you know, I know you understand that based on size, size of your business, but it seems like you're also trying to assist people with that because, and again, I just see so many people out there just saying, you know, okay, you know, we're going to teach you how to buy a note. And it's really, you know, buying the note, I don't think is really the hard part. <laughs> um, you know, anyone can buy the note. It's really the management of it and managing your business uh, from that perspective. Would you agree? No, nah, absolutely. And that's kind of my vision and what I put out, you know, you can only put so much into a course. Um, but I really wanted to lay it out where it was kind of a, a start to finish. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, and I, I the, the guys that I had lunch with yesterday, uh, the, the one guy did buy my course and he was, uh, you know, and it made sense what he said, you know, like the one module is only about an hour, but he said he, he's spent about six hours on that module. Because I I can I I personally cram so much content into that hour that it's taken him about six hours to break that thing down and fully start grasping and understanding. Um, but that's you know that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to um, I wanted to put real deal education together, and that's kind of what I wanted to to lay out everything from building that business um, to the back office. Cause at the end of the day to be successful in this business and you know, it, it's about the back office and there's nothing, there's nothing, nothing sexy and fancy about it, but the back office is what makes this business go. Um, I have a workstation. I have to be at that workstation 20 to 25 hours a week. And if I'm not there, my business doesn't move the way it needs to move. You know, I can handle my business on the phone and I could do some things mobile, but it's that back office that kind of keeps the thing moving. And, you know, something just, you know, really sunk in with me that you just touched upon too, is you're managing 125 notes and you just mentioned 20 to 25 hours a week is what you spend roughly. Yeah. And again, we know it fluctuates up and down and so forth, but on average, is that what you say you think? That's, that's at the workstation. Okay. Yeah. I definitely work off my phone. Yep. Um, everything's linked and synced together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that's, mm -hmm. you know, to scan stuff and to print stuff out and to create documents. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it may be more and it may be less, you know, it, but it's on my time when I want, um, you know, my schedule is created by me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it's truly the non-performing portfolio for the clients that, mm -hmm. m that makes me be at my workstation. And, you know, for your clients that you have um, from a reporting process, how, you know, do you report to them monthly? Do you set up calls with them? Just curious how that interaction goes for people who buy seconds and they realize, hey, look, this isn't for me and so forth. Because again, I don't know, um, you know, it's interesting because there's not really many services like you have where you're kind of an asset manager for other people managing these. I don't know anybody on the first that does it. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm curious for people out there who have some seconds and might be like, I don't want to deal with this anymore. Pick up the phone, give you a call. Um, you know, how's that process work? It's, you know, we definitely interact, um, you know, before we do business, um, we, you know, we always want to be on the same page. So a lot of times when I talk to somebody, it's, it's more about me educating them and making sure that they're well aware of what is about to happen with a non-performing second if they hire me and what the legal process looks like. 
um, and how my time is more valuable um, working my systems and dealing with the loan and to be on the phone um, for an hour every week with each client because there's just not enough time. So what I've gotten real good at is, um, you know, getting approval from the clients through email on, you know, major things of, you know, Hey, can we send out a demand letter? Yes. Okay. The demand letter expired. We're about to move forward with the foreclosure. Here's what the cost and the time frame looks like. Do you want to move forward? Um, when I get something worked out, um, you know, I put the options in front of them. Hey, this is what I'm going to send over to the homeowner. Are you okay with it? So like major stepping stones and major things that happen. Um, I am in communication, um, looking for approval and some direction, but what I operate out of is I operate out of a uh, Dropbox, which is a, uh, a web-based share folder system. So every client of mine has a shared folder with me and their whole folders, their whole note system is in there. We have an admin folder. Um, mm -hmm. We have a, a folder for each non-performing note. Um, when we, when we turn one into a re-performing note, it goes into another folder. But within that specific uh, non-performing note folder mm -hmm. um, is a three-tier Excel spreadsheet that I've created. Um, it's called my dashboard. It, it handles all the, the loan information, the borrower info. It's mm -hmm. at a glance of everything on page one. Uh, mm -hmm. Page two is the accounting, which I usually use the accounting from the servicer, but I do have my own accounting. Mm -hmm. Then on page three, it's a, a log. So everything that I do in real time um, gets put on this log. So, you know, my clients can always log in and see what's going on on their files um, on a daily basis and in real time. And that has worked out real well because, you know, some, some clients may have a full-time job and they get home at night, you know, I'm working five files and they just want to kind of see what's going on with them um, and not bother me or, you know, email me so they can just go in and say, okay, here's what happened today. Like, I always, any email I just copy and throw in onto the Excel spreadsheet. Um, and it's, it's really one of my biggest systems to stay on top of everything um, is to be real detail on these spreadsheets. So I kind of can, you know, stay in check and make sure I'm doing everything in real time the way it needs to be done. Well, it also shows, I mean, a great amount of transparency. So people I would think would be very comfortable in the fact that, you know, they can log in, they can kind of really see everything that's going on from that perspective versus kind of being in the dark, wondering what's going on and not just sending you, you know, three, 5,000 bucks, to, you know, wait through a foreclosure, they can log in and, you know, see what's going on. So I think that's, that's important as well. And probably has assisted in building your reputation in this business by being open, transparent. And, you know, I remember the first time I met you and the first thing I thought of is like, besides, you know, you being an Eagles fan, um, you know, was I'm like, man, this guy is just, you know, such a, you know, a straight shooter and he's going to tell you like it is. And, you know, there's no, um, you know, BS coming out of, you know, any, any side of him. And it was at a convention where, um, you know, 90% of the people I met there were just, I could tell they were just trying to, you know, sell somebody on something that was just uh, garbage. So it was refreshing. I appreciate it. And it's, it's kind of how I sell my asset management service. Like if we get on the phone, I'm not pushing my, my agreement towards you. I'm going to educate mm -hmm. you on what happens in the second space. Mm -hmm. And when we're done, if you want to do business, Mm -hmm. you can send me an email. If not, no big deal. But I know when you hang up with me, mm -hmm. you know what's going to happen in the second space with your note mm -hmm. and with all the notes that I've worked and everything that I've seen. And it's what you said, you know, I'll share the, I'll share the success stories with you, but I'm also mm -hmm. going to share the bad with you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned long ago um, with working people's files. And also when you take money from people, you need to communicate. Um, even when it's uncomfortable, mm -hmm. things aren't working out, deals aren't working out. You have to communicate with your investors. You mm -hmm. have to communicate with your clients um, and you just need to be on the same page and it works out yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing I've you know, been around long enough. I had some bad deals and you know, I had one probably four months ago that we got the property back and we were working at rehabbing it. And basically the JV partner on the deal was like, okay, you know, you know, we'll, we were going to split the cost on the rehab and we had put a roof on the property and then the contractor bailed on us. And it was just, you know, couldn't find anyone. I said, Hey, look, 
I'm just going to bite the bullet on this one and give your money back and stuff and so forth. Because if we keep going, it's, we're going to lose on it. And, uh, you know, I, I knew the person was bent out of shape about it and so forth. Cause you know, again, they had, you know, been seeing people say, Oh, you make all this money on all these other deals or people always, you know, brag about making all these home runs, which yep. you know, it's like being a leadoff hitter. You hit a home run once in a while, but it's all about walks and singles. And, uh, you know, the whole time I told him, you know, just being upfront and honest with him, uh, the yep. whole time. And I think that's kind of what you got to be with people. Absolutely. And I can honestly say I've never rehabbed the pro property from the non-performing second side. <laughs> either, either of I, I tried, but I wasn't successful. Um, and it's funny because like people are like, well, that's what you do for a living. And I said, yeah. And that's why I don't do it because trying to rehab a property from afar is a disaster 99% of the time. So, so a little, a little nugget for you with the second. So, you know, I always say like, if, you know, if a deal's not going to work out, you have to figure out and accept it. So, you know, if it's going to cost you 20 grand to fix a property up or throw it the first mortgage to try to save your deal, you're better off taking that 20 grand and going to buy another note and continuing to play the number game and see if this, see if this deal f figures itself out without you throwing 20 grand at it. If it does, it's great. If it falls apart and you get wiped, it just becomes a write off and you move on. No, it's, it's similar where I know people on the first are like, Oh, if I sell it, I'm going to lose five grand. If I put 20 grand into it, I may make that five grand back and I'm, you know, or, or whatnot. I said, yeah, but look at the amount of time it's going to take you to renovate it. You're going to put in 20 grand to make that five grand, which you're better off. Like you said, same thing, bite the bullet, take the loss, go buy another one and, you know, try and target the 20% return on a new one. That's going to be a lot less of a hassle uh, than trying to, you know, renovate. Uh, or, you know, work something out after the fact, because it's going to take a lot longer and it's going to cost you a lot more. And the agent's probably giving you a number now that's going to not sell for that price either. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Christina Fuller was just, uh, you know, commenting on the Dropbox idea. She thought it was a great idea um, how to share information. So here's another good nugget for you, uh, Christina. I have a, a shared Dropbox folder with my accountant and my QuickBooks assistant. Mm -hmm. And everything goes in that Dropbox and they can access it at all time. I don't do any of my own QuickBooks. Um, they do all my data entry. Um, I put all my bank statements, all my servicing statements. I update all my spreadsheets. Um, I track all my expenses in and out on a, a regular piece of paper. Each bank account has its own thing. I scan them in monthly. I put them in every folder. My QuickBooks lady goes in, does all my data entry, all my reconcile, and we don't even talk. I see my accountant once a quarter, um, but that system alone is uh, very powerful. And my uh, accountant always tells everybody about that particular system. Um, but yeah, Dropbox is great. Um, you know, my whole life is in Dropbox. <laughs> so yeah, I use, I use OneDrive, <laughs> which is pretty much, I mean, same thing. Yeah, better exactly. And but it's the same thing like you mentioned, like with my bookkeeper and stuff, um, you know, she's got, access to my she's got like view access where she can download my statements but i'll put like all my w9s or comments or i'll download and put like you know if i wired money i'll break out what assets it were for i put it in one folder and like i said we rarely talk she'll send yep. you know she'll download everything send me the report and then there might be three four questions i'll usually have a call with her um you know Typically once a quarter, we'll sit down just to go through and just really scrub to make sure everything, but on a month by month basis, you know, we may talk for 15 minutes and, you know, again, exactly. I've a yep. lot of uh, assets as well. Um, but yeah, I definitely, you know, think um, for people who are looking to um, have JV partners or, or, you know, or managing something, you, you need to use some type of cloud that people can just go in and, uh, you know, get information on. So I think it's important um, because it builds trust. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what you want to do in this business is build trust. That's it. And then I end up building like what I call these generic like folder systems. Yeah. So like a new client comes in, like I have a generic admin folder. Yeah. Every year I have a generic uh, yearly folder for each company that just has been added and built. Um, mm -hmm. But it just, I just, drag it over and it creates a new yeah. folder and it's already got everything in it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was gonna say I, I did the same thing. I created a templates <laughs> folder that yep. you know it broken into. I've got due diligence, which is before I buy it, and then I've got kind of my um, the the closing process folder for where the loan sale agreement and everything goes. And then you know, then I got my note, you know, the the management folder, which you know then has folders for my servicer, my attorney, my preservation company. Um, you know, I've got an insurance comp folder. Um, you know, I've got like five folders under that that basically same thing collateral. You know. Yep. Uh, meta source for all my collateral, but I'll download everything. So it's all there. And again, I give access to my partners on that so they can go in and they can see the collateral or, you know, the documents that have come in as well. So I think it's uh, been helpful. That's powerful stuff. So let's see any other questions people have for bill regarding seconds or anything in the note business in general. Cause one of the things that, you know, I think people, um, also, you know, got to recognize as well is again, Bill, um, you've been around now for 10 plus years in this business. So you've seen a lot of people come and go, but also a lot of things happen. And, you know, one of the things that kind of, you know, fr not frightens me, but gives me a little pause is because, you know, the markets are doing well right now. So people, you know, sometimes are, you know, it's almost like people doing fix and flips, you know, the market's doing well. So I'm doing this, things are going well, but, you know, people haven't really experienced, um, you know, any type of, you know, I'll say uh, issues from, you know, an outside influence like the economy and so forth and so on. So I'm just curious um, from your experience with notes, um, you know, you've seen written the waves and a lot of people say when the economy kind of goes down, it, it's a boon for note investors. Um, would you agree with that? Or do you still think you got to proceed with caution in the sense of and just stick, you know, you got to keep managing your business the way you do it? Absolutely. I mean, you got to stay the course. You got to, you know, you have to stick to your, your business model, what you'd like. Um, you know, clearly when a market crashes, um, you know, there may be a lot more delinquent loans that, um, you know, that, that come out into the marketplace. I mean, that's, you know, that's another reason why I don't really buy a lot of equity deals. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're going to pay for equity. And if something does happen in the marketplace, you know, maybe all of a sudden that, deal that you just spent 60 cents or 70 cents on the loan balance, um, you know, just lost a lot of equity. Yeah. Um, you know, it's one of the reasons, another reason I like the, uh, the note space um, is because, you know, every cycle, um, you know, it's just a different aspect of it. So, you know, at the height right now, we're seeing a lot of uh, refinances, mm -hmm. um, you know, and all my performing notes. I mean, even if the market, tanked right now, even if the equity disappeared, you know, my good performers are still going to pay me. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just a combination of everything, you know, just be a smart investor, you know, understand the market a little bit, try not to get too caught up in it. Um, especially with the seconds, it's definitely different than, you know, rehabbing properties or, you know, multi-unit investing, um, you know, and it's definitely different than what you're doing with the first. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because I would think that seconds during a downturn, and again, people always get focused on the equity component, but I think seconds might have less volatility because on the first, uh, you know, on the first when you're buying properties that are fifty to a hundred thousand dollars, usually those are more blue collar workers, uh, and those usually have more you know, higher unemployment or sometimes they first get laid off and they don't have that nest egg as much as somebody with a second on, you know, a quarter million dollar home or half a million dollar home or whatever it may be. Um, usually their jobs are slightly more secure. So I'm curious, um, you know, from your perspective, if that's kind of your thought process that, you know, compared, and again, I know you don't deal with first, but, you know, I think people focus on the equity where I think it's more influenced by job loss than it is the equity at the end of the day. No, nah, you, nah, I, I agree with everything you just said. I mean, you banged it on the head. It's definitely, um, sometimes they get so caught up with the seconds that, you know, it's nice to hear somebody else lay it out the way, <laughs> the way you just did, but it's definitely the truth. Yeah. Um, it, you know, mm -hmm. Because so, a lot of times, I mean, people are paying, you know, like, again, I pay my mortgage. I really don't care if my house drops by 10%. Well, I do, but in this grand scheme of things, it's not going to affect if I pay my mortgage or not. It's if I lose my job, it's going to be the, oh, you know what moment of, you know, what do I do? Uh, 
Um, so uh, a few questions came through. Yes. Um, Hassan mentioned about uh, your loan management fees and so on. Um, and so go ahead. Is that is that specific on what I my asset management? Is that what the the loan management fees are? Is that what? Yeah, I think saying? he was asking how much you charge for your asset management service. Yeah, so my asset management contract, um, I get five hundred dollars up front um, to take on the file. Mm -hmm. um, that's that 500 is, um, you know, I, I board the file in my system. Mm -hmm. um, I check all the documents. I get everything moving for us. Mm -hmm. I then get a percentage on what I can collect up front in arrears and a percentage of what I can collect on a discounted payoff. Mm -hmm. So when I get a note um, reperforming, I give that back to the client. I don't get any monthly, mm -hmm. um, I don't get any of the monthly payment. Mm -hmm. I get 35% of what I can collect in upfront arrears. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I always try to at least get a thousand bucks because that's what my minimum is. Yep. And at the end of the day, some homeowners can only afford a thousand or 2000 bucks. So mm -hmm. I get my 1000. Mm -hmm. um, if that's all I can get, you know, if I can collect five grand up front, you know, I get $1,750. Yep. You know, if I can get 10 grand up front, I get 3,500. I get 35% of the upfront collected arrears. Okay. So with a, th with a thousand dollar minimum. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's very affordable in the sense of what the person's getting and kind of rolls into Jamie's question about JV deals. It almost seems like it's, you know, a quasi JV deal in the sense of instead of, you know, traditional first position notes is some you JV with someone, they fund the deal and then you just split everything 50, 50. Um, but you know, also as the, you know, sponsor on that, you're also taking on risk. It seems like, you know, in your end, um, you know, you're giving up maybe some of the fees or profit, but I'm guessing you're not, there's, you're not taking, are you taking on any risk if it, um, gets wiped? I'm guessing not, but I was just curious. No, nah, I don't. And just real quick, um, I get 35% of the net profit on a discounted payoff. Mm -hmm. And then there's some other clauses for like bankruptcy, um, REOs. Mm -hmm. but if I don't, if I don't get anything resolved and we get wiped, I just get that 500 that I got up front. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, mm -hmm. the power of that is I see the good, the bad and the ugly, and I usually can get paid for every aspect of it. Mm -hmm. Um, now to kind of pinpoint right in on Jamie's question. Um, I was in a fund, uh, for two years back in 2012 and 2013. Um, I got really good at working these, uh, loans out. So when I left the fund that I was in, I kind of took that aspect of our business, the asset management component, um, and I left with the clients. Um, I never got into the joint venture um, partnership. I've always stayed with my contract um, because it's real clean. Like my role is spelled out. The note investor buys the asset. They pay for everything. If they don't like what I'm doing, they can pull the asset out and it's, mm -hmm. they take it back and I'm done. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of how I, I've stayed a good name in this business. And, you know, I, I've established myself with this contract and I keep it like that. Um, like I said, I don't do joint ventures and I have been in a fund. Um, you know, sometimes I question myself if I like to take on more money, but at the same time, more money, more problems. Um, I'm a slow and steady guy and, you know, it's worked out for me so far. Well, you've built yourself a niche and you built your business around what you're doing. And if it works for you, you know, like you mentioned an hour ago, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So. That's it, man. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think that answers most of the questions. Um, do you just want to give a minute to let people know how to contact you, Bill? And then we'll put it also in the show notes when this gets published. Absolutely. So I'll also put my information um, on Chris's uh, Facebook group. Um, he can also put it with this, um, yeah. but I can, my email address is a uh, mortgage pay help. So mortgage, M O R T G A G E pay P A Y help H E L P at gmail.com. So mortgage pay help at gmail.com. That's the best way to uh, get in touch with me. Um, we can set up a call. Uh, we can dive into, uh, you know, any more questions or, you know, any Anything that you're looking to do, I can help you out with. Uh, email is the best way to get in touch with me. Um, I can also uh, give you the, the link for the education program if you're looking for it. I'll also put that on uh, uh, Chris's mm -hmm. Facebook page. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, quick question, but how, just out of curiosity, how much is the education program that you got rolling out? Yeah, right now it's uh, nine ninety seven. Okay, so good. So cool. um, affordable, fair price. Um, you know, eventually it, it may go up from there, um, but I think you know at nine ninety seven, you're you know you're tapping into well over ten thousand hours of uh, real deal experience. So I think it's very worth it. Good. Okay. Well, thank you, Bill, for joining us this evening. And uh, as always, if people want to reach out to Bill, um, you can reach out to him. He'll leave uh, comments on the Facebook group and also be in the show notes. And as always, uh, thank you for listening to this episode of the podcast and go out and do some good deeds. Thank you, everyone.